So this idea of the changing relationship between journalist and audience is basically my focus. And so when I did research, I surveyed newspaper editors, which was actual like pointy-headed academic research. Super, super fun for a journalist like me to get to do that sort of thing. Um, and I also interviewed a bunch of journalists about this idea of how is your relationship with your audience changing. And the answer was different for every single person I talked to. There are certainly some common themes that, you could, that are fairly predictable. But in terms of how is your job as a journalist changing and your relationship with the people you cover changing, that depends. So um, you're going to hear a lot of ideas today about what works for other journalists and ways we can think about this craft of journalism. And I urge you to think about how it applies to the work that you do and that your students do and disregard things that don't work. All right, with abandon, disregard things that you think don't work. But I have a couple of reasons for wanting to, for being really excited to talk to you guys today. One is, I hope that some of what we talk about can help what you and your students are doing concretely to cover your communities. And by community, I mean whatever audience of people you have who are dialed into what you do. And two, I know that some of your students will actually go on to participate in this crazy diverse media landscape. And I'm on sort of a mission to remind people that doing that doesn't just mean picking which stories to cover and writing or producing them very well and hitting publish and then walking away. You exist as part of an ecosystem. So you'd think the planners of this were very, very smart and did it on purpose or something. I'm so excited to see that Stephanie Padgett was here this morning because her actual research into how your coverage demographic communicates with each other and what they expect is a nice lead up. But um, I want to start with this question of what is social media? What do you think of when I say social media? Facebook. Facebook. Woohoo! Definitely social media. Twitter. Twitter. Definitely social media. Instagram. Instagram, LinkedIn. So right away you're going to platforms, right? Telephone. Two-way communication. Telephone. <laughs> Did I plant you in the audience? <laughs> Two-way communication, right? What does it mean to be social? And it turns out we're not set up to be social. We're not set up to be part of a conversation as journalists. What we're typically set up to do is decide what we want to cover it, figure out how to cover it, report it, craft it, share it with the world. I call it Wizard of Oz journalism. You will be grateful. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We will decide back here what we do. Don't pay any attention to how the sausage is made or what we're doing. We will, we will decide what is important, thank you very much, and we will give it to you and you will be grateful and then we're gonna move along. Um, so social, think about how you would behave at a party. You don't just show up and start talking. You tell a story about yourself, right? You're feeling things out to see what you have in common with the person you're talking to. You see how they're reacting to you. Like, did they appreciate that cat story or was that sort of dorky and maybe I should go a different direction? <laughs> you adjust what you're doing based on what you're hearing back. When something's not working, you go a different direction. You hop around and sort of get the feel for the room. That's sociability. So when I talk about social media, the work that my students and I do, I teach a class called participatory journalism that is all about this stuff. And then the students in that class, because of the way we're set up across the street in our teaching newsroom, I'm an editor. I'm a full-time editor at a morning community newspaper. And the students in my class also make up the community outreach team at the Missourian. So sometimes we're referred to as the social media team. And that annoys the heck out of me if we're talking about Facebook and Twitter. It's perfect as a description if what we're talking about is how can what we do as journalists be more social. You with me on the difference? OK. I want to start off with two sort of big picture 10,000 foot view examples that I use to talk about what it is I'm doing here. So there's a super smart guy named Clay Shirky. Anybody heard of Clay Shirky? I'm a big old like fangirl of Clay Shirky. He's an NYU professor, and he writes about media and technology and culture. And the end of his latest book includes this anecdote of a four-year-old girl who's watching TV with her dad. And she goes behind the TV and starts to mess around with the cords. And he asks her what she's doing, and she says, I'm looking for the mouse. The mouse on the television, ladies and gentlemen. Because she cannot conceive of media being purely passive. You don't just turn it on and sit, right? There's something you can do. You customize it, you react to it, you give it feedback. It adjusts to you. So here's what Clay Shirky's book says. Here's something four-year-olds know. A screen without a mouse is missing something. Here's something else they know. Media that's targeted at you but doesn't include you may not be worth sitting still for. 
The four-year-olds of the world will just assume that media includes the possibilities of consuming, producing, and sharing side by side, and that those possibilities are open to everyone. How else would you do it? So when we talk about how we cover things in my newsroom, that's a really common word in the industry. How are we going to cover this? What we're talking about is not what stories are we going to write or shoot. On the community outreach team, we're talking about how will people see themselves in what we're doing? How can people get involved in it? What can they do with it? Where's the mouse in our coverage? So think about some projects you might be working on and how, what it is you hope people will do. What, what, what do you hope the community will do with what it is that you're covering? And how can they see themselves in it? One other example that's also sort of 10,000 foot view from a newsroom I love, The Guardian in London. They have this thing they call mutualization or open journalism. And what it means to them is, let me tell you what this diagram here means. A woman who used to be their head of digital engagement created this diagram. The big blue vertical line is publication or broadcast, going on air, whatever that means to you, unveiling yourself to the public. So journalists are used to working in the top left quadrant, right? We set our own agenda, to use industry academic words. We decide what we're going to cover. We report, we gather information, we craft it into a product. And much of what we talk about, much of what we teach students here at the Missouri School of Journalism as well, is about the craft of journalism. How do you write a good story? How do you communicate properly? What questions do you ask? All very valid stuff. But then what we're used to doing as journalists is getting it to the point where we're ready to unveil it to the world. Perfection, right? That's what we all strive for. And then we hit publish, and then we go back to the beginning of that top left quadrant and start again on the next story. When for the rest of the community, the lifespan of that story is just beginning. And at that point, people can consume it, react to it, share it, find their own little mouse within it, right? So at The Guardian, a couple of years ago, they decided that a lot of their untapped potential would come in those other two quadrants. How does the journalist stay involved after publication? Fact-checking comments, looking for follow-up stories, sharing the story strategically with people who might really want to see it. And how do we get the users, the community, involved before publication? How do we say, hey, here's what we're working on? Whose expertise might we want? What questions do you wish that we asked? What else do you wish we should cover? So today we're going to look at a bunch of examples of what that means in different newsrooms. I know it can be sort of hard to wrap your brain around. But what I think and hope that we're moving to is a much more iterative style of journalism, a much more conversational style of journalism, where we say what we know and what we're working on, people say what they know and contribute to it, and it's like an ongoing thing. This does not work for every little tiny story, but for a topic you're covering over time, for covering a football season, for covering uh, a new school opening, what does it look like over time for the long haul? So I have um, a two-minute video to show you. This is an ad that The Guardian produced to explain to their readers what open journalism looks like for, th for them. This isn't right. The three little pigs are the victims. Three down two houses. You got what you did. But the pigs went too far. You have every right to defend your property. Boiling someone alive hardly constitutes reasonable force. He's going to break the law and entry down. Yeah, protect yourself in your own home. A man's home is his castle. tried to blow my house down, I'd do the same. I knew the wolf. There's no way you could have blown down those houses. He had asthma. But the wolf had asthma. So what's the truth about the pig's houses being blown down? Inside job. There's no reason why those two houses, one made from straw, the other from wood, should have collapsed. Not even a healthy wolf's huff and puff could bring them down. The three little pigs have confessed to conspiring to commit insurance fraud, framing the wolf in an attempt to cover their tracks. Their motive was financial, 
as they struggle to keep up with their mortgage repayments. I'm behind on my payments too. I just... How could this have happened? I've lost everything. So I'm now on a mission to say, keep your trinity chin chins up, fellas, as often as possible. Um, so what kinds of storytelling did you see in that two minute clip? Throw some out. Uh, a lot of Twitter, absolutely. Broadcast, Broadcast. traditional stand up, uh huh. Traditional text stories, yep whether on a big screen, an iPad screen, a print newspaper. Mm -hmm. What's that? Someone was on the phone, absolutely. Someone say survey? survey. Surveys, like what do you think, yes, no, how many, yep. Human yep. You know what my favorite moment is? My favorite moment. There's so many to choose from. But my favorite moment is the YouTube video that shows that the wolf has asthma. Because that was a clip that in this Guardian illustration of how journalism happened was not shot by a journalist. I mean, it was like, a, it was like somebody uncovered this and it became part of the story. No journalist like went and found the wolf with his inhaler, right? And the whole story turns because it's discovered that somebody found a YouTube clip of the wolf with asthma. So the Guardian has this relationship with its community that encourages this, like, send us what you know, what questions do you want us to ask? Do you see what I mean about the iterative style? So it's not a series of concrete stories. We're going to cover this by doing this, 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 and this. It's very open and transparent. So in terms of what this means for different journalists, the answer is always it depends. What is it you're trying to accomplish? Are you trying to grow your audience? Are you trying to get more people involved? Are you trying to be more relevant to the people who do already know that you exist? Do you, are you trying to get the attention of people who don't know you exist? Um, what kinds of things do you cover? Is there, we all can, I'm sure, tell stories of crowdsourcing gone totally awry, right? Where you invite people to help report things and, you know, let's look at Reddit after the Boston Marathon bombings and talk about how the dangers of opening things up to the crowd and whether there are sensitive matters that make that complicated. So in terms of an open style of journalism, you have to weigh what is it we're trying to do and, wh and what could go wrong and what is it we hope success will look like. <coughs> Beyond the craft of journalism, what is it we're trying to accomplish? So I also work in a teaching newsroom where pedagogy is a big part of what we do. So there are times we do things just because today this student really needs to finish this story and I have that prioritized above the needs of a reader, and I am with you on that. So we have that goal, but then we also have the goal of we serve real people who have real information needs, and I want to teach this student to pay attention to real information needs by real people and whether anybody's actually going to want to read this when it's done. But so what is it we're trying to accomplish, and how do we know if we're getting there? What does success look like? What will we celebrate if it goes well? But the central issue with what I'm talking about here is being more focused on the audience. And I mean the audience we have, and I also mean the audience we want, and our potential audience. The journalism that I grew up in doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about attracting audience and about who the audience even is. The journalism that I grew up in at daily newspapers in mid-sized cities is focused on telling a good story. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you ask, the, a, the more diverse the media market gets, the less we can assume that people will see what we do when there are so many places to tune in. So in my newsroom, we did a reader survey, kind of an informal reader survey. And based on what we got back from about a little over 100 readers this spring, which is by no means scientific, it was very informal. But we wanted to get a sense of people's habits. And they told us they read an average of six to seven stories a week. OK, well, that's, that's fine. But we published like oh, I don't know, 30, 40 stories a day. So the journalism that I grew up in would assume that people are following along and getting all of it, and that most of our traffic is coming from, most of our readership is coming from people who have a subscription or who keep their radio tuned into our proverbial dial. 
when in fact, two thirds of our traffic either comes from, web traffic comes from referral or from um, search. So people are getting there from links that were sent to them or shared on social media or by searching. They're not coming to our homepage and saying, let's see what news is today. They're getting there because they care about a specific story. So we, what are we doing as journalists to keep them there and to focus on meeting their information needs? So it can be really fun to talk about four specific projects or specific stories. Why are we doing this? Who is it for? And I have an image of a funnel up here because it's really easy to start broad at the top and say like, all the people of Columbia, Missouri should read this story. Cool. Man, we have some great stories today in the Missouri and we have a story about an African refugee who's been in town I think since 2008 who's gonna see his family for the first time tonight after 11 years. Like the, he fled his village when it was on fire, the family went one direction, he went another direction. He's only known they were alive for a few years and now they're landing at Columbia Regional Airport tonight. Read the story, it's fantastic. So who's that for? Who do we hope will read that? Well clearly I hope you will read it and everyone in Columbia, Missouri should read it, okay? But when you get more narrow, who else might we care? Well, we talk to his colleagues, he works at a bank, custodial services at a bank. So there's a whole community of people there who know him, who would care. He also is the pastor for a service. There's an African service at the First Baptist Church on Broadway. And once a week, he's their pastor. Man, talk about a community of people who we wanna be sure we'll see that story. And then there are all the people who work with refugees in town. We have actually a sizable refugee population here. So people whose job it will be, who, who will likely intersect with that family as they try to help them get settled, right? The neighborhood where he lives, communities of people we hope will see it. So see how the funnel gets narrower? And you can keep it up here, but just hitting publish and hoping all those people and assuming that all those people will find it isn't a style of journalism that seems focused on the audience. And where will they see themselves in it? So today when we put that on Facebook, I left a comment underneath, underneath it that said, we were alerted to this story by a reader who thought this guy had a journey to, to tell that would be interesting. Thanks so much to the reader. I would have named him, but I didn't have his permission. If I'd thought about it, I would have asked him and named the reader who gave us the story. And I said, if you know of other people with amazing journeys in town whose stories you think we should tell, here's my email and phone number. So if you see yourself in this, what can you do about it? So in terms of what people want and why they're seeking us out, you guys have a benefit in that you are doing a niche style of journalism. You know who you're serving. And it is more niche than what appeals to my neighbor also needs to appeal to me, right? You're not trying to get retirees along with yeah, yeahs, right? You're not trying to cover gardening along with taxes. Like you could probably narrow, I don't know how many of you have, you know, kind of plans for what it is that you cover, but you have a, a more narrow, you can wrap your brain more easily around what it is you're trying to do. Um, and you could, I know that, that there are probably a lot of varying distribution models in here, varying frequency, um, varying how much is online versus in print. But it's interesting to me, this is a screen grab up here from the show Mad Men. Any Mad Men fans? Oh, I love Mad Men. Um, and this is a focus group where they brought in people to, it was about, it was about dog food and they wanted to sit behind the two-way mirror and watch how dogs consume dog food. You could listen to people talk about it, right? So this is, so feedback from readers used to be so hard. It used to be that newsrooms would bring in focus groups and bring in a dozen readers and give them cookies and say, and the readers would say, we want more world news. And then you put more world news on the front page and feel really good about yourself that you're doing it because readers asked for it. Now, it is so easy to get reader feedback. One way is web analytics. Like we know that we put up a three minute video but that people only spend an average of a minute with it. Like that's feedback, we probably want that. We know that we did this really long thing but we published it on a Friday afternoon and by the next week nobody had paid any attention to it and we should share it again because nobody read it and we think they would like it. We know which topics and stories people tend to share. There are wonderful resources that you can see how that happens. There are wonderful, easy digital ways to get feedback from your community if you ask for it. Easy ways to embed quick surveys or, or um, you know, even anonymous ways to get feedback from people. Would you like to see more of this? Do you have any more questions about this? Tell us what person in the community you think we should write about and, and ways to, to get that two-way thing going on. So 
This is my five W's. I don't even actually know if there are five. I think there are more than that. Um, but it's not just about the what of journalism, the craft, right? It's about who can help make it better, whose expertise do we wish we had here, who knows which questions we should be asking. Journalists tend to kind of swoop into things that we don't know that much about, and I'm constantly reminding my students that the crowd knows way more about it than we do. So we, if we want to do a story about what this African refugee family is likely to face, there are people in the community, like I can, I can, th I can make my list of questions, but oh my gosh, the people who will serve as host families for them and help them go grocery shopping could tell me a lot more what questions I should be asking. So whose expertise could help guide this? Who most needs the information or is already talking about it? And have we thought about whether they're likely to find it in traditional ways that we distribute it? Where, when, and how do they need it or want it? Is it the kind of thing they're likely to get from their phones and should we keep it quick and snappy? Or is it something they're willing to access later from a place where they're gonna read something longer? And have we shown to people how and why this is relevant? So, um, yes ma'am. Uh-oh, you gotta wait for the mic. Make Adam run. Run, Adam, run! This morning I saw something on the news and it was the Rolling Stone cover with the Boston bomber. Uh-huh. Uh, question, what did you think of that and who were they trying to serve? Well, I haven't read the story yet. Has anyone read the story? I heard it's actually a really fantastic story. Yeah? Well, I think I would, I would hold off judgment on the cover until I know how well it represents the story. I think there's a long history of magazines trying to be provocative to get people to buy it, and I have no idea whether it seems like a fair way to do that or a completely inflammatory way to do that. They put the cover of the bomber. It's basically replicating a rock star. Jim Morrison. Yep. <laughs> and the article is well written, but they just basically write about him becoming a monster. And the reason they claim is that he... Uh, replicates their audience, their age group, and so they feel that it draws them in, but I think it's disgusting. I, I don't think we should be glorifying or treating any terrorist type of, or bomber mm -hmm. killer as a rock star. Yeah. One of, one of my Facebook friends, when he saw it, he said, is this a, is this a, journal, a problem with journalist perception of the audience, or is it a problem with audience, audiences not being media literate? Which I <laughs> thought was an interesting question because, um, well, should we really say, well, in order to uh, consume the news that we produce for you, then you must be at a certain, right. you know, uh, plane of, uh, on a certain plane of existence that right. clearly if you don't appreciate this, yeah. you haven't attained or something. No, I mean, I'm all for media literacy. But no, that argument sounds like what I say to my students, like they write a really clever headline and you walk up behind them and look at their headline and they have to explain it to you. And I'm like, you know, honey, that's great. If you want to go to every reader's house and tell them why the headline's funny, then, <laughs> then I'll let you get away with it. But if you have to explain it, it doesn't work. So, yeah. <laughs> I actually heard a different um, explanation for the cover this morning that I thought was really, it won me over. I actually agree with the cover. Um, and it was, they said that it was to show people that um, this exists within our population and that a terrorist doesn't look like a certain way or, um, you know, it's embedded mm -hmm. within our society and that you can't just assume that a terrorist is going to uh, not look like your son or not be attractive. Because yeah. when you see the picture, I thought, he's kind of a good looking kid. I very much disagree. Um, all of the high school shooters look just like your sons. So should we put every high school shooter on one out on every magazine and newspaper cover? Because that's exactly why they do it is to get the sensationalism and mm -hmm. to get popular. I mean, all of the high school shooters look like your sons. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the TV show The Newsroom at all, um, but one of their plot points was about um, revolved around like the Casey Anthony um, trial and the coverage. And if you think about how many young mothers kill their children, if you think about how many wives kill their husbands or husbands kill their wives, how come some of those are sensationalized? And some of that does deal with like niche 
things like appearance or socioeconomic status. And I, I think that that is something coming out of this that it's people pick and choose which stories we experience even though this is one story and there are a thousand others of the same story that never get told because of one tiny detail. What makes something resonate? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'm not going to issue a ruling on <laughs> the appropriateness of the cover, but it's a good discussion. So in terms of service to community, you know, when we talk about things like um, how much can your community tolerate with things like profanity or like photo ethics when we talk about um, gory photos, you know, there's not one answer to should you show a dead body on the cover of your publication. There's not one answer because that answer in Wichita and in Miami might be really different. So part of the focus on the audience is how will the people this is targeted at respond? Will it help them understand the story? Um, and if you're a national magazine, that's a more complicated question to ask than if you have a community you can wrap your heads around. But probably among you guys, you would have different answers to what style of storytelling your community might appreciate. How much snark, how much attitude, <laughs> um, how, where, where the lines are of appropriateness and inappropriateness on a lot of different levels. So um, I want to look at some examples of community and how community can exist around news. And I use news really, really broadly. Um, I use news to mean whatever information you have to share with the people who turn to you for that information. Um, this is a Facebook page for a newspaper in Missouri called the Houston Herald. It's a weekly newspaper in southern Missouri. And I came across, actually this time last year, when this group was here last year, I was also doing a presentation for the Missouri Press Association. So it was a whole bunch of weekly newspaper editors, publishers, reporters who were up here, and we filled the room with both groups. And so I was scouring social media for community newspapers in Missouri. And this one kept popping up as being really outstanding. They have more likes on their Facebook page than they have people in town. They have a Facebook page that is absolutely the town megaphone. They get on at the beginning of the day, basically two people in their newsroom, and they get on at the beginning of the day and schedule several posts to go out throughout the day. They use a tool called Hootsuite to schedule things, and then their phones alert them if people respond or post on the page, and otherwise they just kind of let it, let it float, right? But the community has embraced it as the absolute best way in town to reach the rest of the community. So people get on and say, oh, well, this is an example of I'll come back to that. So this is their post by others section on their Facebook page. Just a reminder that the city pool will be open. Thanks, Harold, for the coverage on the motorcycle cruise in. And then the Herald gets on and say, thanks for those of you who missed it, here's the link. When's the fair and fireworks? And somebody says, last night. <laughs> somebody gets on and says, I'm trying to locate somebody who people in town might have information about. So it is announcements on behalf of the community. When I interviewed these people this time last year, they had just had a situation where the police department had called and they had found a kid who was missing and they couldn't get the kid to talk and they did not know who this kid was that they had found. And they'd spent an hour trying to get the kid to give up any details about who they were. Their response next was to call the newsroom and say, can you put this on your Facebook page? Describe the kid. And within a few minutes, the kid's grandmother had seen it and called and said, oh my God, that's my kid. So the police department knows that the best way to reach everybody in town is the Facebook page. Now that is not something consciously that these two guys who run this newsroom set out to create, but it happened. And when you listen to them talk about why they do it and why they appreciate it and why they put some attention into Facebook, they talk about their desire to stay relevant, their desire to reach people where they are. They have a weekly newspaper. They're never going to train people. If the, if the paper has always come out in Houston on Wednesday morning or whatever, they're not going to train people on Monday afternoon to go check the website. But what the editor told me was, you know, I'm re reaching people in their living room in their pajamas if I put it on Facebook. And everybody in town is dialed into Facebook. They have some strategies they use to try to reach that audience. For example, they, the two guys who are there who live in town personally friend everybody in town that they can, including high schoolers. And then, when they put up an album of pictures from the high school football game, they tag the players. So all of a sudden, the whole, the teenage community is being social around high school football through the players. They're giving each other a hard time about their haircuts or whatever through the pictures of the newspaper. 
So when I ask him, like, how does that then lead to dollars for you, or, you know, what does this mean? They don't have any answers about how that's going to drive web traffic or increase subscriptions, but they're not sure that these teenagers are going to get print subscriptions. Another weekly newspaper editor said, um, you know, that in 18 years, his subscriptions had gone down 200, and it's not because people canceled, it's because they died. And they're not really sure what the reading habits of the next generation would be. If you're used to leafing through the paper on grandma's coffee table, what are you going to do next? So I don't know what reading habits are going to be, but I do know that if these people have a news organization that is the place to go in town, and they want to stay relevant and have a relationship for the next generation, this seems like a good place to start. So where is their community around what you do? We'll talk about some more examples of that. Um, I just wanted to share this as an example. The Houston Herald shared, so a man with Houston ties was eliminated from America's Got Talent. They didn't have a story about it, but there was a Facebook post from that, that guy's agent. And they just shared the agent and say, here's the message to the supporters. So when we talk about conversation, that doesn't just mean what story are we going to write. Like passing along to people who care another update, even if it's not your original content, is part of conversation. I wanted to show this example. This is an editor at The Guardian with very big nostrils. Okay. Open journalism has been at the heart of what we do on Guardian the Sport for the best part of a decade. Because simply put, it makes us better journalists and it also provides a better product. On Guardian Sport, we were one of the first people to incorporate the comments from our readers into our live blogs back in 2002. And ever since, we've been trying to push the boundaries. We're getting readers right at the heart of our content. In 2010, for instance, for the World Cup, we recruited a fans network of over 150 people from around the world. We knew exactly what it was like in downtown Accra, for example, when Ghana qualified for the quarterfinals of the 2010 World Cup, because we had people from the Guardian fans network tweeting, blogging, and sending us pictures via Flickr. Well, I think if we weren't as open as we are on Guardian Sport, we would be behind our rivals. We wouldn't be the, you know, the world's leading sports website. We wouldn't have won the Sports Industry Award for Website of the Year during which the judges praised the way we made our website a two-way experience because we would you know, we'd just be like any other website and we're not any other website. We're, we're Guardian Sport and we do open journalism. So these are two really different examples of where's the mouse. So with the Houston Herald, you want to know where the mouse is. Like you go to their Facebook page. Their website isn't different from any other community newsroom website. But there is the expectation that you will participate and that you also have access to this audience that the newspaper has. You have access to the community. It's handing you the microphone. And then here, if you like soccer, football they would call it, yes? Football. If you like football, hang on, I got to get this back, figure out which screen I'm on. No. Um, if you like football, shoot, now I'm all messed up, sorry. If you go to see their football coverage, you're going to see there an invitation to help them cover it. Go into the World Cup, we are lining up people in each city that has a team, because we can't be everywhere. So here's how you can help today. They have a ton of examples at The Guardian of how they will say, here's how you can get involved. Join this live chat. Comment here. Um, OK, hang on. I'm going to have to just focus on this for a second and see if I can get it working again. There we go. This is what I want. Huh. There we go. Good, good, good. OK. Um, OK. So this idea of news as a conversation, do we really want it? And are we willing to listen? So think back to the party analogy. You go to a party and you ask a question. Hi, how are you? What do you do? You can tell when someone's not listening, can't you? When they don't really care. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. What do you do? and then they're just tuning out because they're only asking to be polite. That's what I see with most news organizations. Hey, what do you think? And then people comment, 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 and say what they think, and nothing. No acknowledgment that they're talking, no indication that it's going to have any influence over what they do as journalists. So you know what? Don't ask. If you're not willing to take that into account, don't ask. If it's not going to lead to something interesting on its own that you're willing to dial into, it's not worth it. But if you do want the two-way experience, then how are you going about getting it? What invitations are you issuing to people to consume it? Hey, you might like this. We thought you might be interested. What invitations are you issuing to converse? So often, journalists will pose, will say, oh, I really thought that would lead to a whole bunch of comments or conversation, but nothing. OK, but what did you, did you ask a question? 
Did you try to encourage conversation? Did you poke at people and try to get them to respond? Or too often you just like throw it out? And then what invitations are you issuing to contribute? More like this, more ideas like this. What are the questions do you still have? What else do you think we should be covering? Yeah. We, we had a conversation in the last ethics panel about your personality on social media mm -hmm. and who you are, how much do you reveal um, I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer, but um, it was she was it was a religion reporter, and we're Kelly. You know, are you Kelly the Christian? Are you you know, or do you keep that a secret? Mm -hmm. or you just yeah. So, what, what your thoughts on that? Well, it might not surprise you to know that my answer is it depends. Um, it depends on your community. It depends on who you cover. It depends on what you cover. It depends on which issues are sensitive. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if you work in a small town, you don't have the luxury of being a human sometimes and a journalist other times. You just are who you are. People are going to cost you in the frozen food aisle at the grocery store and tell you what they thought of your last story and what they think you should be covering. So there's not much point there in not sharing personality because everybody knows it. Um, if you, like, cover national politics, then nobody cares if you want to cheer for the St. Louis Cardinals, but you better not issue any kind of opinion about controversial social issues. On the other hand, if you cover soccer for The Guardian, maybe nobody cares who you voted for. But you better be careful about wh whether you inflame your coverage around your people who follow you around specific things. It also has to do with personal comfort. I'm a documented oversharer. So you can learn a whole lot about me online that other people would feel uncomfortable with. I also make really good use of like friend lists and privacy settings to make sure that the pictures of my kids aren't getting broadcast to people who just follow me for journalism reasons. You do overshare. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that, Adam. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I am definitely not one to tell people, hey, you really need to talk about like, what you're doing this weekend on your Facebook page if you want your readers to trust you. Not at all. And yet there are tons of examples of journalists who, when they are willing to say, um, you know, share something about a movie they saw or the fact that they broke their leg or, um, you know, a vacation spot or something that it makes them seem more human. And I don't know if you guys follow people on social media around hobbies or passions of yours. You follow somebody who covers tennis because you really like tennis and you feel connected to them if, you, if they do more than share headlines. So there, there are good arguments for sharing some personality, for sharing some behind the scenes stuff. Um, like, you know, here's how this came together, or here's some other stuff I learned, or I get to interview this person today, I'm excited, check back later for the story. Do you have any more other specific questions about that? Okay. So, um, I want to talk about this idea of what you share and when you share it. Yeah. Go ahead, I had a question. Um, when we think about engaging audiences, you know, I've, I've been talking to my students about, uh, you know, and asking those questions, those invitations, to beyond just the audiences, but, but the sources, too. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, one, yeah. one thing that, that I've suggested to my students is that we send out source, um, like a little survey to sources. Uh, you know, how did we do? Mm -hmm. uh, is that part of the conversation that we should be having as well with, with, with Absolutely. Uh, d you know, stakeholders beyond just the audience? As long as you want to know. Yeah, do you want to know what your sources really think? Because i got to tell you, we have a reader's board, and many of the people on the reader's board joined because they're frustrated sources, and they have plenty to say. But you know what? Then they, get it, then they know us, and then they feel they know that we want to know, and they get in touch when they're frustrated. We had a student this spring who like, showed up at a prominent city official's house with all this like, urgency around, why haven't you returned my phone calls? And of course, it was because the student was up against a deadline and was like imposing her own urgency on the source when the source had like not even gotten the message yet because the messages only started coming an hour ago or something crazy like that. So yeah, I want that source to know. And half the, most of the time, the source wouldn't even bother. They would just write us off and not talk to us in the future. So yeah, if you, if you let them know that you want to know, absolutely. Asking sources things like, what else should we be asking? And what, what, do you wish, what questions do you wish journalists were asking? That's one of my favorites. Don't ask people for story ideas because they don't think in terms of stories. Just think, what else should the journalists in town be paying attention to that they're not? And a lot of people have a good answer to that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. So examples of how we share what we're working on, as long as we really want people to know. 
The Oklahoman has a really wonderful sports section, and this is a post from last year. A sports reporter has a blog. And it's significant that this is on a blog, I think. And she says she's looking, um, it's during the NBA playoffs, and she's looking for this car from Los Angeles that's driving around Los Angeles, that's driving around Oklahoma City, and she wants to know. She's trying to track down the driver of the car so she can interview them. And she puts this post up, and yes, indeed, it did lead to identification of the people who drove the car. So it's significant to me that this is a blog. What is a blog? Who has an answer for what a blog is? Anyone? Sometimes I just hear people call it an online journal. Sure. So when I'm sharing photos of my kids, it certainly feels that way, right? What else is a blog? Sometimes it's like stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness, so it implies, so there are several things implied there. Um, some sort of informality and not like well-crafted, edited stuff. Maybe kind of frequent updates. Okay. Sometimes that's true. Anyone else? It could be um, like opinion pieces on something. Uh, it could be long text. It could be short text. It could be added with a picture. Captions are on there too. Music could be on there. Uh, so just a variety. So lots of kinds of media mm -hmm. and opinion. Certainly some people look at it. It's often first person, which implies that there's opinion involved because it's from a perspective, which is something journalists often don't feel real comfortable with. It's interesting to me that this is on a blog. I, if you look up blog, a blog is a medium of publication where the newest thing goes at the top and each post gets its own headline. I think we run into trouble when we consider it to be a kind of content. Because like Nick Kristoff of the New York Times has a blog. Like there are, there are whole news publications set up on a blog format that doesn't, there's nothing in the inherent in what is a blog that means it's got to be full of opinion and written a certain way and informal. But there's something about how journalists think about blogs that makes us really comfortable doing this. It's easier to do this than it is to imagine putting that on the front page of a newspaper. Although at my newsroom we do that. We'll put on the front page of the newspaper, here's something we're working on, can you help us? We're looking for sources, what questions would you ask? So she has a relationship with her readers, and people want to help her. You know what else is interesting about what we share on social media? You know what happens in my newsroom? The Columbia, Missourian Facebook page will share something. Here's what we're working on. We'd love to hear what people think. Do you know of anybody who's going through this, that sort of thing? And we get very little or zilch. And then I share it on mine, and I get tons. And I'll say to people, a couple of times I've actually said, like, did you see this on the Missourians page, or would you be likely to contribute if it's on the Missourians page? And people say things like, well, but we know and trust you, Joy, and we just want to help you. And they know, I'm, they know I'm asking as a journalist. I'm never like, I'm not like secretly gathering their responses to publish without their permission, right? Like they get it. The Missourians asking this question, can you help? And yet they're likely to respond to a person rather than a brand. And in your communities, you likely have people on staff who are known. Like it's a small enough community that there's benefit in having a person be the one doing the asking, not something impersonal. And if you look at most news online presences, it's pretty impersonal. Yeah. Doesn't that make journalism more subjective? You know, aren't we supposed to be the objective automatons going out there and? Adam, you are baiting me. Unapologetically, um, you're unapologetically baiting me. Uh, I think there's a lot lost in the name of objectivity. I think there's a lot. I, I'm not sure I believe in objectivity. I think there. I think we all come with biases, and if we could acknowledge them more freely and incorporate them into what we're doing and be transparent about what they are, I wish there were a disclosure page for every journalist that said, "Here's where I'm coming from. You should know as I report this that I'm a mom with kids in school, or that my husband works for the city, or." that I know a lot about this because I also have a dog. I just think we should, we should look for ways to have personality, and I'll talk some more about that. Um, I know that objectivity also can be useful in teaching young journalists what it means to be, a, to be a journalist, but I also think there's a lot lost in terms of separation from community. Um, so at some point we decided, and it's, it's pretty much an American, <laughs> relatively modern American philosophy that means like we need to stay separate from our community, and we're going to stand over here and pretend we're not part of it and look down upon it and cover it that I think is very different than what you can achieve if you're part of the community. One of the things that I think is really interesting 
the students you'll be teaching is that, you know, your, your students are of the community they're covering. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, in, in, in journalists, in my, I come from the same philosophy as Joy, uh, <laughs> Is that, uh, <laughs> Otherwise, in, in, you wouldn't have so recklessly baited me. And in, in, in I, of course, anybody. <laughs> but um, it, you know, it is uh, uh, it, it is interesting. A lot of journalists um, are like they're like uh, a parachuted into a community and they cover it and then they get out. Uh, and uh, and you know, and then we see um, surveys that say people, by and large, distrust journalists. Uh, and and there's probably a relationship between that. Yeah. And what's really interesting is I think we're as, as you know, Joy is, is showing that we're entering this sort of era of, of a very personalized journalism where journalism is, is that two-way conversation between people, not institution and, mm -hmm. and audience, mm -hmm. but you know, among people. And I think that uh, teaching students to do journalism, to tell these stories in an environment where they are of the community that they're covering mm -hmm. uh, is really in a natural place to be able to start that sort of changing um, uh, ethic of what journalism really is in sort of that two-way conversational mode. Mm -hmm. but, isn't, but isn't also uh, beat coverage supposed to take care of some of that, become an expert in your field, cultivate mm -hmm. the sources, mm -hmm. be in the same place, get to know them, the baseball writers who would ride with the team on the train, that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's a way to not be launched into the sudden coverage, though I don't know how you could maybe be covering, for example, uh, the guy coming in on the the guy whose family's coming in on the plane tonight, mm -hmm. I mean, unless that was part of your beat somehow, but I mean, I, so I think there's some definitely some very narrow mar uh, places where it would be hard to be anything other than uh, uh, an outsider. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I mean, if if you don't mind, or, no, please. Uh, you, you mentioned um, you showed the example from the Guardian sports editor, and I think the sports sports has always been sports. Do you know any sports? Writers or editors at the Missourian who don't particularly like sports. No. Yeah. So they're they're fans of sports. Yeah. We in fact we encourage sports reporters and editors, or at least we accept it that they are fans of sports, but we don't accept fans of Democrats to be political reporters, or at least you know secret. If there's they could be secret fans of Democrats and they could be political reporters maybe, or secret fans of Republicans. So the the because we see this 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 notion of you have to be very objective and in, 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 in sort of away from this thing that you're covering. And it's, it, politics is the easy example, but it goes in a lot of forms. I was address is just actually that fans of politics don't have to be fans of a particular, I mean, even if you're a sports fan, right. even though you have a, a team you sort of secretly control, yeah. really um, being that, so political writers are fans of politics, they're political junkies. But they also have opinions. But they do have and we like, it's really comfortable to pretend that they don't. Our sports editor is fond of saying that he would never in another newsroom hire a bunch of Mizzou students to cover Mizzou sports. We don't have the option here, and you guys don't have the option either. So are we going to, like, we can talk to them about what it means to come, to set some things aside and how you give up some of your fandom in order to cover it, and yet only your newsroom and your situation can decide how comfortable you are with the fact that you're covering a specific thing for the audience of people who feel a specific way. There was an interesting debate that I was reading on Twitter today. Brian Kinney is an anchor... Um, sports guy for MLB Network and I guess he introduced um, at a press conference on Monday the NL starting pitcher and said you know let's give this guy a round of applause he's the starting pitcher uh. and he got crickets and so he was saying you know can't we be human this I mean uh -huh. this is a exhibition game uh -huh. um, it's not a real game it's not a you know can't in this case, can't we be humans right. and, and give the guy just a little round of applause? And, and, you know, another baseball reporter chimed in and said, you know, there's no, there's no cheering in the press box type thing. And, and there's it's no a, cheering in the press box, but what sports reporter doesn't at some point say, hey, congrats on the game, coach. Can I ask you some questions? I mean, there, there yeah. are just ways that we behave as humans. And you know what? A weekly newspaper editor just south of here that I spent some time with, he starts his stories by saying congratulations to the girls' soccer team for their win at regionals. That's not going to fly. That's why the answer is it depends. Yeah. Because that wouldn't fly in Columbia. We have two high school. Are you kidding me? You're going to congratulate one of the high school teams? No way. And that's why this conversation would be very different if it were directed at people who cover national politics. I have a former student who traveled with Mitt Romney during the presidential campaign as a reporter for Politico. Well, my advice to her about how to use social media is so, so different than if she were representing a small geographic or niche community that she could wrap her head around. 
Good questions, man. You have to wait for that microphone or Adam's going to beat you upside the head. Uh -huh. One of the challenges in, in newsers, especially in sports, because that's where it happen, happens the most, is beat reporters having to be columnists as well for the sport that they cover. Mm -hmm. And in one moment, you're talking to the coach and trying to be straight up and, and talking about you know how you performed in that game. And then you close deadline on that, and then your day off game piece is, wow, is this guy a nitwit for every decision that he made in that game, and that's why they lost. And then you have to go back and be the objective guy on, on day three. And, and it's, it's a ridiculous circumstance to put people, to put the reporters into. But it happens in especially smaller newsrooms <laughs> daily. And that's why with a more conversational style of journalism, it's murkier because the labels aren't as clear. Like today I'm writing a column, so I'm going to tell you this, but you won't see any sign of this in my other story because it all lives together and it all travels on its own. You know, like individual stories travel on their own and take on lives of their own and have to be able to stand separate from the rest of your work. And it's also really, really easy to go find the rest of your work and nobody's ever going to forget that column you wrote. So I think there are things we do like, oh, but this is a story and this is a column that are meant to make us feel better about sort of the conventions and routines that we have. But a very smart editor I talked to um, in the UK was very upfront about not believing in the style of, in our focus on objectivity because she said, like, why would I hire somebody to cover gardening who doesn't love gardening? Why would I hire someone to cover soccer who doesn't love and is passionate about soccer or politics or whatever? And they just have a very different style of, they want the passion and the determination and the knowledge that comes along with really caring about what you cover. And when it's gardening, it's easy to see that, but then you get into other issues and we get a little more uncomfortable. Okay, so back to the topic of like, are you ready to listen if you ask? And what can be gained from asking and being more transparent and starting the conversation. So this was a blog, right? And I think blogs are really interesting because they make us feel more comfortable with, sure, I can see doing that on a blog, but what about a story file on your website or a box in a print edition that says, here's what we're working on? It also is really comfortable on social media. Have any of you faithfully gone to the Lewisburg picnic for years and years? Would you be interested in talking to me? Here's how to get in touch with me. How hard is that? It doesn't work at all if what you want to do is really, really narrow, like we're looking for something, for somebody who has a birthday born on this date and a favorite color of purple or something. I get a lot of lazy reporters who say, just put this on Facebook and I'll get some sources. It doesn't work that way. But being willing to say we're looking for people who, um, we're looking for recommendations for what we should ask this teacher, or favorite moments from this, or did you go to this, or did you have an older brother who you also went here, or did you, you know, here's what we're looking for, and inviting people to get in touch. We are very good at writing conversationally. And it, this is an example of sharing what we don't know along with what we know. Remember what I said about the craft of journalism, how we're not really willing to unveil things until we have the questions answered and we're done? This is an example of saying, here's what we wish we knew. Here's another one. A weekly newspaper that says, we heard a loud explosion around 11 AM. Here's what we think it is. Um, let us know if you heard the boom and give us your location. So this is a weekly newspaper in Missouri in a fairly, fairly rural area that had 109 comments on this Facebook status. So old school journalism is, this happened, we're going to ask a bunch of questions, and once we have answers, we'll acknowledge that it happened and answer the questions. This style of journalism is, we recognize that this is what everybody in town is talking about. We don't know, but we'd love to know if you know, and we're trying to get a sense of how widespread it was. So what are people's motivations for leaving these comments? What are these, why would these 109 people decide to take time to say, here's where I live, and yes or no, I heard it? And I, or I bet it's this or not this. What are the motivations? Because they want to know what it is. It's they want to know what it is, so they just want to kind of be a part of it. Mm -hmm. What else? Oh, yeah, so there's, like, you want to be smart, right? Like, you want to be the one who shares an answer, or has the, the winning hypothesis. Sure. It's something that's important to them. Something that's important to them. It matters. Like, I'd be awful curious, right? There's also the, um, it feels really good to tell, to share what you know. Like, isn't it kind of cool to be like, well, I know something you don't, or how did you not know it was this, right? 109 people. One thing. One thing that I'm noticing is that the Ozark County Times is letting the community know that they're listening 
to them because mm -hmm. it begins, the residents have been heard re reported hearing, mm -hmm. and yet they don't know enough yet to make a story, and it's not deadline time, but they're mm -hmm. letting them know that they're on top of it. Mm -hmm. We're paying attention. We know what's going on around town. We're in touch. Yeah. I think people love being problem solvers. Yes, they do. I mean, I, I do. Yeah. So I can, I can help here. I can help, right? Uh-huh. So the second post from two and a half hours later says, we're assuming they were sonic booms called by military aircraft, but I love this part because they call out the source. Calls to the Air Force Base and the FAA have gone unreturned. We'll continue to share what we know. So this feels really natural on Facebook, and I wish we could figure out ways to incorporate that into our knee-jerk reaction to how you cover things. When we talk on my team about what it means to cover things, we put it in quotes. Cover it doesn't just mean a series of stories. We talk about, like, how are we going to involve people in this? How can people see themselves in it? Where's the mouse? So this is being willing to say what you don't know along with what you know. We do that quite a bit with crowdsourcing. We're working on a story that says about the lobbying efforts of a group called No Kill Columbia to stop euthanizing animals at the Humane Society. So we talked about swooping into communities, right? And not always knowing what we're going to get ourselves into. Oh my gosh, I have that experience as a reporter, especially before the internet days, like the first source before you could really easily research on your own. Oh my gosh. I once read a story about pulp mining in Juneau, Alaska for an Alt Weekly. I was like 22 writing about pulp mining in Alaska. It was funny how little I knew and those poor sources. So what questions do you hope we'll be able to answer? What perspectives should we keep in mind? Here's the name and email address of the reporter. So what we got, the 12 comments, when I took the screen grab there were 12 comments, was from people who care deeply. It was things like, you should not even use the words no kill because that is like loaded politically. Apparently in this community it's like pro-choice, anti-choice, like which words do you, the semantic choices matter a great deal. Um, people said, oh, you should look at this town because they're set up similarly to Columbia, take a look. So it was very valid, like here's, oh, you want to hear about our world? We'll tell you about our world. This is a big deal, right? The reporter was totally overwhelmed because what she got back was like 12 stories worth of information, not just one. She thought she just had a story and it turns out she had a story. So do you really want to hear it? Because it made her life both easier and harder. One of the ways it makes it harder is that there's some accountability. Like you ask readers what they want you to do, and then they, get, they give you more than you can do. And are you accountable then to say, well, I'm going to answer these questions, but not these questions. Or news broke and I got taken off the story, thanks anyway, guys. Um, and that accountability can feel uncomfortable because the Wizard of Oz style that feels very comfortable and what we're used to is like nobody even knows what we're working on until we're done and we unveil it. But if you're willing to say, here are some stories we have in the works. You know how I wish this would manifest? Especially when covering a beat. What if at the end of each story, the reporter said, here are a couple things I'm working on next. How hard is that? Here are two stories I'm working on for the next issue or next week. What else do you wish I would cover? Or what questions do you hope I'll ask? And here's my contact information. How hard is that? Continue, invite the next chapter of the conversation. Do you guys use Google Docs? So I'm a huge, huge fan of the Google and of the embeddable Google Docs because of how easy they are to use and how easily they embed into any CMS that I've ever seen. So this is a Google Doc whereby we created what's called a Google Form and we said, give us, we type some text in the top, and then we say, give us a paragraph space, and then it's open for people to type. It can also be a rank this one to five. Oh, the next example is rank this one to five. Which of these issues are important to you? We're deciding what questions to ask city council candidates, or whatever, issue, insert issue here. Tell us how important these topics are to you. And you choose which kind of answer you want. So this is a ranking one to five, this one is open paragraph. And then the answers get dumped into a spreadsheet. So what else would you like to know? When we're covering something on an ongoing basis, embed this at the bottom of a story. What else do you wish we would ask? People can stay anonymous, or a lot of times we'll leave options for them to say, if you'd be willing to be contacted by a reporter, include your name and email address. So standing invitations. So I want to talk about um, A couple things we've done in my newsroom. This might be the example that Adam said he had mentioned to you guys about covering our city um, transit budget. Is this what you mentioned? What was the bike thing? I, I mentioned it there last week. 
Okay, never mind then, moving along. Okay. Um, so, you recognize the funnel? Who's the audience, right? So, a couple examples, and I want you to think about whether this has any bearing on the kind of stuff that you guys cover. When my newsroom was covering um, the fact that the transit budget was under review and that bus routes and prices were going to take a hack, and people were mad about that, especially like paratransit buses. People were fired up. So my newsroom does two weeks' worth of coverage of this. Kind of a dry topic, except that if you care, you really, really care. So leading up to the public hearing about this, we thought, who are we doing this for? Who really needs the information most? Well, it turns out there's going to be a public hearing where people who are very passionate about this are going to show up. Gone are the days when we can assume that everyone who shows up will be informed and will have read our coverage, which was better than anybody else's in town by far. So we made a handout and summarized two weeks worth of reporting on the front and back of an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and printed out 100 copies and took them to the transit meeting. This is low tech. That's why community outreach is not about social media. This is social. It's taking the content to the audience. It's customizing distribution based on where and when people need it. It's not assuming people will have seen what you did. So while everyone's sitting in the, the packed city hall waiting for their turn to talk, while they read the minutes of the last meeting, they're reading Missourian coverage. And at the bottom of it is a QR code and a link for a few further coverage and headshots and contact information for the people involved in the story with questions like, what else do you want to know? Or how will this affect you? We just printed out three cents a piece in the newsroom copier and handed it to people. We also did it when we, on the anniversary of 9-11, we did a story about how to talk to kids about 9-11, like how much graphic detail to share. And we realized that the audience for that story was people with young kids who probably, you know, how likely were they really to see the story in our print edition or on our website. So we formatted it like a handout. This is a case where I have an army of students that I get to just tell what to do. And they spent, we printed 800 copies and spent an afternoon taking it around to after school programs and picture day at soccer and put it directly into the hands of young parents. Because otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, we will have done this story and patted ourselves on the back about what a great story it was, when really, the people most likely to see it might not be the people who actually need it. So are we really congratulating ourselves on the craft of journalism rather than service to community? Why did you do it? Do you want people who need it to actually do it, to actually see it? Or are you hoping that their grandparents will see it and pass it along? Because honestly, if it's just in the print edition, that's what's going to happen. Another example. <laughs> this will resonate with you guys, perhaps. I was talking to a couple of you beforehand about what happens when new schools are created. So we have a new high school opening. One of the things that meant for us is that bus routes were changing, and we needed a three-tier start, start time system instead of two-tier, which means somebody's starting school really, really early. So plan one last January was for the high schools to start at 7.15, which is really early. And there's a lot of research that says that's not when high school brains work best, right? So we're trying frantically to report on the story. We get administrators, we get the bus folks, we get teachers. It's like 1 o'clock on a weekday in January. And a I hear a reporter saying, I just need to find students. I've got to talk to high school students about this. Where am I supposed to find high school students who are tuned into it, who are going to be eloquent about it, and who actually want to talk? So I start to follow social media breadcrumbs, looking at who is retweeting the Missourian stories about this. And somebody's retweet led me to a Twitter account that led me to a Facebook group called Student Say, whereby, ladies and gentlemen, 400 high school students in Columbia had joined a Facebook group specifically designed to have a voice together across high schools. It had only started like a week before, specifically designed to say, uh-uh, you're not making decisions without us. And it had spread fast enough that 400 high school students were in it. So I get to walk back out to the newsroom and say, like, you want high school students? You don't have to go hang out at the mall and hope you find eloquent high school students. Here. So she tweeted back at the person who seemed to be the organizer, who then tweeted back and said, well, I'm still in school, but we have a substitute in math, so I could probably answer your questions now if you really want me to. <laughs> and by the time school was out, we had a story published with the organizer of this group. She then contributed something for a section of the paper we had called From Readers, where she wrote really eloquently about what it's like to try to get high school students to work together and how hypocritical it is that adults want you to act like an adult, but then when they're ready to make a decision, they don't involve you in the decision. We wrote a story about her. It was fantastic. But there's a community that exists if we're willing to listen. Where are people talking about what you're doing? The next day, I got to go into the news meeting 
and say, I hope we're sending a photographer to the school board meeting tonight because the teenagers are all like talking to each other about dressing up and who's going to speak on their behalf. And the room was indeed packed with teenagers. Yes, we had a photographer there. And then the next day, I posted an image of the front page and say, like, hey, here's Jilly on the front page. Thanks so much to those of you who took the time to talk to us for the story. We're going to continue covering this. Please tell us what questions you wish we would ask. That is social news, and it has nothing to do with the fact that it's on Facebook. It has to do with the acknowledgement that this is part of an ongoing process. Invitation for how you can see yourself in our coverage and get involved. Paying attention to what people are saying, even if they're not saying it to you. They were saying it to each other on Facebook, and I'm just lucky enough to have found it because I started to follow some links. So there are news organizations creating Facebook groups. And I'm really interested to hear from you guys about if this is something any, any of you guys have done. Facebook groups for your, for your publications or even just for your schools. ProPublica is an investigative news organization in, in New York, and they start Facebook groups for ongoing investigations. This is one to do with patient harm and one to do with student debt. And they just start inviting sources and other people who are talking about them to the Facebook group. And they share what they learn as they report. And people start to, and they say, hey, here's what we're finding. Does that resonate with you guys? What else should we be looking for? And then the sources start to invite other sources. And there's this lovely snowball effect. And then there's a whole, they are, there are multiple products there. One product is that it helps their journalism. One product is that they find more sources, and another lovely product is that they're connecting people around something they care about. So sometimes, like with this example, it was a matter of me finding the online community, talking about what I was covering. This is an example of a journalist creating and helping facilitate a community of people to talk to each other. Does anybody have experience with Facebook groups as part of your work? Yeah? Can you tell us about it? My journalism program is actually a part of what used to be called a, com called a computer magnet, and um, I rebranded it and called it the North Media Arts Lab. So I had students help me with my rebranding, and uh, they actually created my Facebook page uh, and went out and sought out kids, and I think within a day and a half had 100 students uh, liking it. Mm -hmm. So we just, we've built off of it every year. Um, I post our... Uh, newspaper stories on it. I post any kind of um, events that we're having, uh, photographs. I take a lot of uh, pictures during class when we're doing activities and post them on there. Mm -hmm. um, we've really uh, focused on community engagement and getting parents on there so they can see what students are doing during the day. So mm -hmm. it keeps building and building. It's getting more and more popular. So is it a group people have to join or a page that they like? Oh, yeah, maybe it's a page they have to like. That's fine. Yeah. Also interesting, and it sounds like you're doing more than broadcasting your links, which is awesome. Is Facebook blocked at your school, kind of thing? Um, you know, it is, but the question was, is Facebook blocked at the school? Uh, Facebook is blocked. Um, I have a computer lab, so I can unblock it anytime we need it. Uh, it's also not blocked on their phones, so, and it's not blocked in the library. We have two computer labs in the library that students can use on their off periods, and it's not blocked there, so. I have a question. Well, do, do your schools block, I mean, my school blocks, I think, in Facebook in certain rooms, too, and, but do they block pencils? I mean, meaning the kids can do a lot of things with pencils, too, that you might not want them to do, but we teach them how to use pencils properly. Um, it's an ongoing conversation that I've read on Twitter. You, you know, it, it's about teaching them how to use the social media properly um, instead of taking it away from them because they're going to use it anyway on their phones. Um, you know, they're going to say things under their breath. Are we taking away their vocal box? I don't know. Uh -huh. It's just an opinion. I have a couple of different groups, and actually, we did have our Facebook blocked, and then I went to technology and showed them my Facebook group for yearbook, which is an open group. And I have 400 members, and the whole community and whoever is a member can contribute photos that we use for the yearbook. So they unblocked it because my, face, or my yearbook class used it so much, and then, um, which was a win. That's so that awesome. was good. And then I also have a Facebook group for uh, I mean, it's, our, it's called the Talon Brainstorm Group, but it's our newspaper 
Um, and we brainstorm ideas on that because it was an after school club and so we could never meet. So we would basically meet online like at home and then brainstorm ideas and who was gonna cover what. That's private, but I mean really anyone could join if they're wanting to write stories. Uh -huh. And then um, I have a video page when we post uh, our shows and that actually has a lot of parents that go to it and will comment because they want to see, because of course the students that are in the show don't want to show their parents, but then the parents want to see them, so at conferences they always ask. So we have a lot of parents that go and like it because they want to track what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It can be so useful. Our, the new high school that's opening here this fall has Facebook groups already for like, here's the Booster Club and here's the Truly Anything. And I join every group that'll let me join because I get so many ideas. It's this window into what people are talking about. And it's really common here for teams and social groups at the high schools to have Facebook groups where they keep in touch with each other. And I, and I, do, I do think it's largely also parents that join in. I love what Dan said about using the tool properly because I think, you know, even, even taking it a step back from an academic setting, you know, there's a lot of blame that happens with like, well, you can't believe what you read on Twitter. Well, you can't believe what you hear on the telephone. Like, it's a problem of uh, improper or inaccurate communication. It's not a problem with the tool. So if you heard it on Twitter, it's, you heard it on the street, you heard it on the phone. So, and teaching them that Proper use of social media will um, affect lots of future, lots of their future, <laughs> in terms of what is appropriate and future employers checking you out. And like, we need to be teaching them how to do it right. Um, okay. So a few other examples of what it can mean to be social and how we approach the news. Okay. So some of these, this one has sort of a, a, a high tech aim to it, and I don't have the infrastructure behind this setup to make it work, but I find it so, so interesting. This is called Curious City, and it's a project of WBEZ, which is public radio in Chicago. They do a lot of fun things. Um, and I'm sort of a public radio person at heart, even though I've never worked at a public radio station. I just think they're really fun. But this one is called, it's a project called Curious City, and the prompt in the box says, what do you wonder about Chicago, the region, or its people that you want WBEZ to investigate? So you put it in. The staff decides if it should be displayed, so if it's inappropriate, it doesn't go up automatically. And then you can vote, and they show three at once and say, which one should we investigate next? How fun is that? In terms of opening up our agenda setting, what is it you want us to cover? Now, I don't know that I want to have a whole staff of reporters at the beck and call of the community to say, like, I don't know, like, I, I don't want to deploy just based on people's silly ideas. But sometimes we have a version of this in our newsroom that um, asked people what they want to know. And we got a question recently about like, that was sort of tongue in cheek, but it was like, when did streets and parking spaces get narrower or is it just cars getting wider? Why does it feel like I never fit on the road? So we were able to say, here are what the laws actually are concerning how wide streets are and parking lots are determined based on who owns it. And yes, cars have gotten wider. Let's look at some sizes of cars and how that's changed. So that's kind of fun. It's not a story in terms of we're not going to wake up in the, in a, on a Monday morning and say, you know what the burning issue facing Columbia is today, but people are curious. So what's wrong with answering questions? And it starts with an invitation, with being willing to say, what do you wish you knew? Adam? Can I put the devil's advocate for a second? Yes. OK. So there was a, on The Daily Show, I don't know, six months ago, a year ago or so, mm -hmm. there was a, John Stewart did something where he, he was making fun of CNN for something that they had called Choose the news. I don't know if you've seen this clip. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's you know text us your choice. This really important story uh, <laughs> A. This really important story B. And this really important story C. And then and John Stewart said it's like the Sophie's choice of news. <laughs> and uh, and and so you know obviously the you know, and then he kind of goes on and further and says well isn't that aren't you isn't it your job supposed to filter Right. You know, down this and and you know right. and tell me the re you know so so it's this it's this it's this um, dueling purpose uh, yeah. you know almost or you know we want to uh, involve the audience and and as some someone said you know like some of the small communities people want to be in the know people want to help you know but at the same time people want um, journalists to perform a service. Yeah. 
Right, so how do we balance those two competing ideals? Uh -huh. That that really made me think of something is, I, I feel at some point, this type of thing can go a little too far. Uh -huh. um, every, I'm a sports fan. Every once in a while, I listen to sports talk radio, and it lasts like a day uh -huh. because I hate when they have people call in to the shows yeah. because Idiots. they're so uninformed. Yeah. I will never read the comments of a newspaper section again. Because if I read for two minutes, I feel like I just want to scream and break my computer. Mm -hmm. Because again, they're very uninformed, stupid, a lot of times uh, worse than that. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I want to hear the professional journalists who are trained to do their job well. I want them to do their job. I don't want to hear from my neighbor or somebody like that who has a strong opinion on everything no matter what. So I don't know, where do you draw that line? Well. Um, first of all, to Adam's point, I think there's a reason we don't decide all of our stories this way. We don't say, like, should we cover the city council meeting or the cat in the tree, right? Like, there's no point in that. And people do trust us to share things we think are important. We don't just give them exactly what they say they want. So, yes, the balance between giving people what they want and giving people what we think they need. My boss calls it um, broccoli and Cheetos. Like, we're going to give people some broccoli even if what all they think they want is Cheetos. And they really do want us to give them broccoli, even when we list things, they're not going to say, yes, broccoli, more broccoli. They know they need some broccoli. And they, they do trust us to help keep them informed about their community because they don't want to go to the city council meeting. But they sure want to know if the, street, the speed limit on their street is changing. So, yes, there's a balance. Let me just say a couple words about comments. There's a wonderful piece that published on um, pointer.org a couple of years ago, written by Matt Thompson, who used to be a fellow here at the Reynolds Journalism Institute, that basically says, like, if your comment section is terrible, it's your fault. Because the problem, so remember what I was saying about how when you go to a lot of online presences for news, it, it feels one way? Comment section are also, like, we really still want it to be one way. We're not listening. So we say what we're going to say, and then we're like, OK, great unwashed masses of idiots, talk amongst yourselves down here, and we walk away, right? It's our fault. We're not present. We're not listening. We, it's like we've given up. So there are so many things you can do to make comment sections better. First of all, like real names versus anonymity. People are less likely to be jerks if it's with their real name, right? Um, Fact-checking comments. And my newsroom will get onto the comment thread and say, actually, that's not true. And here's a link to where we previously reported that that's not true. Um, having a good comment policy and sticking to it. Being ruthless about what you delete. No, those are not the kind of comments that are welcomed here. Some newsrooms, and that's different in every newsroom, some newsrooms have policies that say you have to stay on topic of this story, and other ones don't. But if you have that policy, delete it, because that's respecting the time of the people who are choosing to read it or to comment recognize that certain kinds of stories are going to get certain kinds of people and consider turning off comments for those stories or just being extra present. At The Guardian, they have what they call thread duty, which is it's somebody in the newsroom's job to read the comments and be present and alert reporters and editors when they should be checking back in and deleting things. And just sometimes even saying, hey, this is Joy. I'm monitoring comments today. Nice to see you guys. Remember, here's a link to our policy. And it is amazing what that solves. It doesn't take away the idiots but it can make a culture where idiocy is less welcomed. I will also say I have a column I wrote for our newsroom last year that I call my love letter to comments because of how often we get wonderful comments. People who, God, we had this terribly tragic story about a couple of MU students who died in a car accident driving back from Texas. And you know who left the first comment? The woman who found them on the side of the road. And then who left the next comment? the mom of a friend of theirs who had just spent the weekend with them in Texas, saying their mom's not ready to read this stuff, but I'm going to save it for her. Thank you so much for filling in the gaps as we all try to figure out what happened. The comments that point out errors, I want them. I want people to tell us when we're wrong or to tell us what else we should have asked, because I want to set the record straight. And I want them to know that I'm listening and not just ignore it. And I want to correct publicly when we're wrong. The comments that say, hey, but what about this, and suggest another story. And then I want to go back and give that reader credit 
when we decide to write the story that somebody suggested in a comment and go back to that first comment thread and post a link saying, thanks for the suggestion, we just wrote this story based on that. So part of that is a matter of scale. If you cover national politics, you're not creating a community in the same way as you are if you know the people you're commenting with. If, the, if people are going to accost you in the frozen food aisle and tell you what you should write, like you probably have the size community where you can wrap your brain around it and foster the kind of conversation that is constructive and write a policy that works for you about what kind of conversation you want. So I agree with you. After the Zimmerman ruling this weekend, I just wanted to slam my head in a door and I wonder why we even have online comments. But that's not the kind of journalism I do. I'm lucky enough to serve a very specific community. And the people who comment are very often people who are directly touched by the story and who know they're being accountable to their neighbors in the way that they behave. Doesn't mean my comment section is genius, but it means it's a lot better than a lot of them. Other questions about that? You guys are awesome. This is so much more fun than if I were just talking to myself. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> I have to say too, um, I, watch, I, I watch The View every day, I record it, I watch it when I come home. And that's one thing that's kind of turned me off, like you know, Barbara Walters, she's this, you know, she's done all these great stories and she's interviewed all these people and her fascinating stories things. Um, she's annoying on the show, but she, they're all on Twitter and one of the things that she mentioned is that she doesn't read her tweet. Like she reads the tweets but she just can't be bothered to respond to them. And when she said that and the attitude that she had when she said that, to me there was a huge turn off. I mean, part of, the, part of the purpose of Twitter is to have a conversation back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was kind of interesting when yeah. she said, I just can't be bothered with that, you know, to respond to the, you know, these little people that no, are No, it's a problem of me. scale. I mean, she probably gets like thousands of people tweeting at her a day. She does. She does. But it was just the way yeah. she said it. I with just, derision, which yes. I also heard over here, Steve Altstadt, right? I, oh my God, never will I read this. Okay, so then don't ask. If as a news, I totally get where you're coming from as a person, I'm not trying to pick on you, but like as a news organization, if you really don't want people to comment, then don't let people comment. But don't comment and then not read it or just complain about it and not do anything to make it better or make it constructive. Um, one thing I really love um, about the Today Show is like Carson Daly's role, um, that he's sort of like the media aggregator. Um, and during like the Paula Dean sort of fiasco, they would go out to, hey, this is the immediate reaction we're getting from Twitter. And so it, they make Twitter relevant without actually going too deep into it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I don't really care if Hoda reads what I say, but I want to know that my voice matters. Mm -hmm. And also, I've never tweeted at Today Show, so don't judge me. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, you want to know that your voice mattered. That's why those 109 people commented, like, they've got something to say, right? And you want to know that somebody's actually listening. Absolutely. And even if they're not listening, even if they don't mention you, the fact that you get sort of like, have you ever gotten retweeted by somebody sort of semi-famous and you're like, oh my god, that's so exciting. Yeah, I love it. I have a question though. Um, the town where I teach, we have a very small newspaper, it's a very small town, and I, I hate to feel this way, but I truly feel like the reason they have a comment section is to let things become inflammatory. Like, they will leave up terrible, horrible comments about teachers in our school or our administration. We had a scandal a few years ago with a male volleyball coach and a female player, and they would call out other people in the school, and they would leave it up for hours, and then they would take it down. And I, I mean, maybe it's just a case that they weren't checking it, but I kind of feel like they did it to just sort of see what happened. I don't know. So I have two perspectives about that. Okay. One is that's really, really terrible yeah. that that was up there, and maybe that's a case where you turn off comments. Another, though, is that I get accused of that all the time. Like, you're just letting people comment because it drives traffic. Yes, my paycheck is increasing mm -hmm. because you guys are idiots yelling at each other, right? No. And I can't believe, even in a newsroom that's pretty well staffed, how often something, a comment gets, it just like slides by. Unless you work in a newsroom where they have to be approved before they go up, mm -hmm. which can also be a really good plan if you're having trouble with comments. Um, I mean, it happens to me all the time that somebody, now, they should also have an option to flag a comment mm -hmm. so that editors get an email or something if, it's, if a reader points out that it's bad. But I mean, I think it's totally believable that they just wouldn't see it, especially with a small staff. Like, you go out and report a story, and anything that happens on your website while you're out reporting a story doesn't get noticed. It happens in my newsroom. Or that reporters will, you know, people ask questions in comments, and I send them to the reporter. And the reporter then 
works to, sometimes they have the answer in their reporter's notebook and sometimes they have to make another phone call, but we attempt to answer questions that come up in comments. But very often by the time they get an answer and come back, like that person's attention span has moved on. They're not even gonna notice that we answered their question. Um, time is different in newsrooms. Okay. Um, I wanna skip, I wanna make sure we get to some interesting things here. Just a couple other ways to get conversation. Um, the Chicago Tribune hosts a whole bunch of events, and this is getting pretty common, where they'll say like, um, you know, we are putting together a panel discussion on this issue that's of importance to the community, and you can come like buy a ticket, in a lot of cases it's revenue generating, but also just thinking of distribution. If you want conversation around what you cover, one option would be to have an in-person conversation and invite people to come join. They're really interesting examples of that. This is a newsroom I visited in Connecticut, the Register Citizen in Torrington, Connecticut, and they are turning their new, they have turned their newsroom into, they have, they added a newsroom cafe. And they have like a room that's sort of cafeteria style. They call it a newsroom cafe, but you know what it is? It's one of those Keurig machines where you like drop in a dollar and make yourself a cup of coffee. And yet there are tables. They made sort of a little used bookstore library thing in the corner. And they have free Wi-Fi, and their town doesn't have a lot of Wi-Fi, so that was kind of a big deal. They put in a TV. They have computers you can come use, like the library does. You can search the archive, and they'll help you do that. They have a little blogging station where they train people, and you can, they hope you'll blog for them as well. And there's no wall between all of that and the newsroom. So you can come in and wander through and talk to the reporters. You can listen in at the news meeting and see what they're planning to cover. They also live stream and live tweet their news meetings. So, when we talk about, this is another reason that social media for me has to be broad, because this is a very social style of doing journalism, but it's very analog. It's not about, so should you host a time where people can come talk to you once a month after school and tell you what's important to them? Are there offline and online solutions for the kind of conversation you wish would happen around things that, are, that matter to your community? In terms of being more social, what about your content is interactive? This is another example of a Google form. We do a lot of quizzes. Mizzou joined the SEC last year. Big news in a college town, right? So that meant that every weekend we had a brand new football opponent. So we did all this stuff to introduce you to the new opponent. We found YouTube videos of their fight song. Here's what they're gonna be singing and embed that on our site. It's not original content, but it's what people wanna know. Here are their traditions. We made a quiz, that's what this one is. The University of Alabama is located in what city? It gets harder. The quiz gets harder. <laughs> um, and we could tell from our analytics that 800 people in Alabama took this quiz because geography doesn't matter when you're on the internet and boy do Alabama fans want to show you how smart they are. So, you know, making that interactive, we could just say here are some facts about the University of Alabama or we could make it a quiz. And this is a Google form so you can either take it anonymously or leave us your name and email we could run it as a contest. Enter to win a coupon for pizza for the if you get all of them right, you'll be entered to, for a drawing for whatever. We have a From Readers section where people submit their own stories. And this is a case where a student had made a dress out of duct tape and had written about it on her blog, and we asked her permission to republish it. Ladies and gentlemen, she had to cut herself out of this dress to go to the bathroom. She didn't exactly think that part through and then like tape the seam up again in the back. But it's funny. It was the most read story of the week with somebody's blog post about that. Our From Readers section involves, includes all kinds of stories. This is what we published this week. Somebody sent us pictures of a snake he found in his car in Columbia, Missouri. Um, a person who works at Stevens College wanted to give us an update on um, facilities updates they were doing this summer. A blog post from a woman who's making a solo kayak journey down the Missouri River. Somebody who wanted to write, this says the remarkable story of Ruth Welver. This is just a really interesting 90-year-old woman in town, and somebody else wanted to write about her. She's just really, really interesting. What if you invite people to tell each other stories? What if you put up a list of questions and say, pose this to other students? What do people not know about you? And invite them to do their own interviews and submit them. Do you edit those stories? Do you? We have a um, great question, and that's different for different newsrooms. We have up some guidelines of editing, and we basically edit on behalf of the reader. So we'll edit, we'll break up paragraphs that are like this into manageable paragraphs, and we'll clean up some grammar and stuff, but we don't edit them, we don't edit them for style, and we don't edit them to meet our standards of how we would write. If you have three exclamation points at the end of your story, we're gonna leave it. Joy, mm -hmm. yes, I sir. have two questions about these lists. Yes. On the iPad, on my iPad, uh, I uh, call up uh, the most read stories in the Missourian this yeah. week uh -huh. there. Uh, one of the questions then is, what do you make of it? I just read it, no, that's interesting, and I haven't synthesized it yet, but I suspect you have 
of what is the most read? Yeah, uh, from week to week to week, yeah. what have you learned? Um, I do a lot of work with our analytics. And I have to tell you, the most read list on our homepage, as is the, ha the case with a lot of news organizations, show you just what got the most page views. So if University of Alabama football fans liked one of our stories and sent it around on one of their lists of fans, posted it on their fan message board, then it's going to get a lot of traffic. Well, that doesn't inform a whole lot of the decisions I make covering Columbia, Missouri. So we sort our analytics by overall page views, but also by what matters to people here. So the list of top headlines that I pay attention to is from IP addresses that are within Columbia. And then we can look at what was most popular. I, I do a lot of, I spend a lot of time with time spent. So how, what stories do people actually read? So the story this morning about the African refugee, people spent an average of five and a half minutes with it. That means people read it. That was worth our time. If we write a story like this and people spend an average of 90 seconds with it, then we did something wrong. We lost their attention. And one of our analytics services can actually tell us at what point people stopped reading. So this is feedback we didn't used to have access to that now we do. And we should be making at least some of our decisions based on what are we doing right and wrong. So that doesn't mean should we cover crime or the cat in the tree or city council, because the benchmarks are different. We expect different kinds of traffic and viewership of those stories. But it does mean that we have feedback that, feedback that should roll into how we make decisions about what we cover. The, the next question then I have, when I open the iPad main page for the Missourian, uh, there are usually six stories uh, or headlines and mm -hmm. first sentences displayed. I suspect 80% of those are reader generated things or some high percentage of that. Really? I'm just amazed at how you're getting that reader content onto the, uh, onto the front page, including the main pictures of that. Interesting. So you, know you must have a lot is? of influence with the editor. Oh, I have tons of influence. Not really. Um, well, I, I'm surprised to hear that it's quite that high. But also, they, all, they often have pictures, and our iPad app favors, like the algorithm that we use it to choose favors things that have pictures. But also, we have a very, our approach to what we display is pretty neutral about where the content came from. We're going to give people what they think is the most interesting. So reader stories will be the centerpiece on our homepage on the website, if that's what we have that's most interesting that day. And that's not usually up to me. I mean, the way placement works in our newsroom is that People from all different departments can pitch their stories, but then it's a homepage editor, a news editor, who's deciding what's there, and it's not me doing it. So that means they think it's good. Yeah. So somebody else had, Roger, who was the person who, who, who collects a lot of reader stories in here? Hi. How does that work for you? How do you use them? Um, we don't really have a journalism department at our school. Um, the students had an idea to come up with the school newspaper because they felt like they had something to say. Mm -hmm. So only the students who need elective credits are the students that are in the class. But there are other students who have a voice as well. Mm -hmm. So one student asks, well, can I just email you something that I wrote that I want to go in the school newspaper? Um, it came through, I showed it to the principal, the principal loved it, and he said, you should open this up to all the students on campus. Uh, I opened it up on Wednesdays, I make an announcement to the group, you know, we're collecting stories for the newspaper. If you have pictures or poems or art or anything that you want to share in a newspaper, go ahead and email it to me or give it to me so that I can scan it and get it in the newspaper. And it's been working really well. We get about 50 students per issue, 50 or 60 students per issue to actually write something for the paper. That's awesome. So my experience with soliciting contributions is that there are the people who will do it because they think it's cool to get published. And will say, oh, I wonder what, what story should I tell? What should I write? For most people, though, it's more situational. The guy who sent us the picture of the snake did it because something really weird happened to him, right? And he wanted everyone to know, oh my god, don't leave your windows down. This just came out of the car parked behind my house. The woman with the duct tape dress, like, she didn't just set out to tell the newspaper a story. She put that on her blog, and we asked permission to run it. So sometimes I'm seeing something and asking permission to republish it. I do a lot of inviting, though. After the um, Supreme Court rulings a couple of weeks ago, we got a comment on our Facebook page about how the Defense of Marriage Act ruling would affect somebody in the community, and he just left a comment, and I emailed, or somebody on my staff actually emailed him and said, I wonder if you'd want to tell us more about that. And then later that day, we had somebody to share that was a first-person perspective on a national issue. 
So sometimes we'll see people talking about things and say, would you want to share that perspective with our readers? Sometimes people get in touch with us and say, you need to cover this. We, we are having, my group is having this bake sale or car wash this weekend. And I'll say, unfortunately, I don't have a reporter I can send, but if you're going to be taking pictures and you want us to publish them, we'd love to. It's a way to say yes to the community. We get pictures from like, you know, somebody's 90th birthday, all his kids come home and they take pictures of the family. Well, sh of course I'll publish your pictures. I can't send a photographer to your house to cover, right? I can't, we can't cover traditionally your family birthday party. But absolutely, if you would like to share with your community the celebration of your dad who's 90, yes, I say yes to that. OK. Um, yes, sir. That's a pretty big change in what we think of as journalism, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. I, I mean, I think it's great. But you know, yeah. did, does it, I don't know how to, how to say this. Do we have to kind of? Stop thinking, like journalists I think for a little bit of time have thought pretty highly of themselves like this is clearly journalism and this and anything outside of this yep. shall not be journalism. Yep. I mean. Journalism it, is so to... funny. I mean it's not a club you join. There's no certification like if you're a plumber. My last newsroom was a New York Times paper on the west coast of Florida before I came to teach here and our editor did a survey and only half the people in the newsroom had journalism degrees. It's not like there's something you don't go through, right? Like you. It's just crazy that we think there's something special to it. And you guys are reaching people at the point where they're just deciding what they have an interest in and what they care about. But even from a professional standpoint, we have lots of, prof we have lots of smart people in town who can write about all sorts of things. Um, it is also, though, the answer of how you handle it is it depends. Because partly it's a matter of scale. If I worked at the Dallas Morning News and I let the community know that we'd publish their birthday pictures, I would be inundated and I would have to hire somebody specifically to process all of that and fact check it and make sure it was OK with the families and all that stuff, right? So in my community, I have something still that I can manage. There are plenty of, I'm sure the Dallas Winter News has some sort of society thing, right, where you can submit your own and they will only choose some of them. That would be another way to go about it. And if I ran out of time to handle the volume of submissions I was getting, we'd have to put some more parameters on. We don't have a lot of parameters now. There are, there are limits to how frequently people can submit. OK. So, a few more examples. We only have 15 more minutes, you guys, so chop, chop, Joy, get to it. Um, a few more examples of what it can look like to be social. So I heard somebody mention Storify, right? Did Janet, you guys saw the My Life, My Town thing at lunch, right? I think when I came in and grabbed a cup of iced tea and disrupted your whole lunch that I heard her mention Storify. So we use Storify a lot to reflect conversation. Oh, this is a case where we actually used it. We had a high-profile football player who was arrested for smoking something, possessing something he shouldn't have been possessing. And we didn't realize that there were a whole bunch of people saying, who is this guy? He hasn't even played that much. Why should I care? So we used Storify to embed some links and create sort of a timeline. So Storify is a tool where you say, like, drag this link over or this tweet over, and then you can type in between. So you're weaving together a story based on the set of links. So we just said, hey, remember when Gary Pinkle like, landed on this guy's high school? Our football coach landed on his high school football field in a helicopter. Like, here's the beginning of the story. Here's how highly he was recruited. And then here are some of the chapters of the story. So we're doing the a service by aggregating a bunch of links. We also use Storify to reflect conversation. So we have a Twitter list of football players, Mizzou football players. And once a week during football season, we collect tweets from them. Some of it's about the game, and some of it's trash talking, but you know what the popular ones are? Like, here we are in our Halloween costumes, or here we are, the new video game that came out this week, and we're playing it together, and so-and-so's feet stink, and I sure wish my mama's cooking was here, because I could use it, and it's, it's, the, it's their personal life, right? People care. So once a week, we share that snapshot. We go through the work at the beginning of the season to create a Twitter list of those 50 people, and then once a week, we scroll through it and pick the interesting ones. Helping people sort through the noise in their community can be really interesting. I know, I'm sure that your students say a lot on Twitter that should not be amplified. But would it be interesting to, have it, to make a Twitter list of people in the school who are on Twitter and find the ones that should be amplified and reward them? Like, here are some funny overheard on campus sorts of situation. Here's what people say. Here are people's behind the scenes photos. Here are people's Valentine's Day messages. Here are, you know, here's what's being said. buy into all the uh, social stuff, but I'm more from the old school journalism, uh -huh. and surely you're getting some calls every once in a while about, 
hey, there's a guy running a meth lab in the neighborhood, something of that nature. Or there's a city councilman that's on the take, and here's the evidence. Sure. So what are you doing with those stories, and how are you uh, covering them? So social doesn't just mean happy. Um, death is social. Funeral homes figured that out a long time ago. People want to be able to say, my thoughts and prayers are with the family. Here's what was great about this person. So what it means to look social on behalf of a complicated or touchy or sensitive issue is different. I'm hoping, I'm hope, I think I have an example coming up that will speak directly to that. Do you mind if I put it on pause for just a second? Okay. And if I don't, I promise I'll talk to you about it. But yes, social, people are talking about things even when they're difficult things. And it makes it more complicated. What do you include and not include? The stakes are higher than saying, here are the football players with stinky feet. But reflecting the conversation and harnessing it and empowering it and amplifying it is still part of the job. Um, okay, I'm gonna speed up here. The Washington Post has a great platform where they share, they, ask, they use this for all kinds of topics. Here's one where they shared it for baseball. At the beginning of the baseball season, they asked Nationals players, what are your favorite baseball memories? At the top of the page, you can enter your own, and then you can scroll through what people think. This is a way to cover the start of baseball season. Invite and harness conversation around what's awesome about baseball. The same thing could be done as a story a traditional story, let's go interview 10 people about why they love baseball. Um, this is an example of how when Albert Pujols left the St. Louis Cardinals and people were really, really mad, a TV station or radio station, I think TV station in St. Louis put this picture up and invited people to Photoshop it into other scenarios. Where do you wish Albert Pujols would go? <laughs> and they got some really funny answers. Social around the news, that's a way of covering the news. You can also do the man on the street and ask five people in front of the post office what do you think about Albert Pujols leaving? This is funnier, way more fun, and you're more likely to find people who care. When an OU football player got, um, had a season, I think maybe career-ending injury, the Oklahoman put up this page that says, get well, Ryan Broyles. And they put up a, one paragraph about who he is and what he contributed to the team. And then they said, leave your thoughts here about his brilliant career. Tell him your favorite moment from his career. Say hello, thank him, wish him well. Inviting conversation around something is a way to cover it. People want to do this. How are we inviting them to do it? One of the ways that my team covers football is that we set up a tent on a lawn of a building on campus that's right down by the stadium, and we hung a sheet off the side of it and put up a fan photo booth and invited people to come get the pictures taken. So these are crazy, I think it was Georgia, crazy Georgia fans. Um, we also invite people to predict the score. But then we put an album on our Facebook page of all the pictures, when people come get the picture taken, we hand them a slip of paper that says, here's the Facebook page where your picture will be up in a few minutes. Go tag yourself. Because then people tag themselves in the photos, and then all their whole network sees their picture. So then we have people congratulating each other on their new haircut using the Missourian's photo. But when you think about how football is social, how can you tap into that? Ask people to send them their own photos, but also we would then see traffic go up and likes on the page go up when people got to the stadium and started to click through. What do you offer about yourselves as you're inviting people? We talked about showing personality. There was a dog show in town, and we decided that one of the ways we wanted to cover the dogs, dogs are social, right? People love their dogs, and also there is something about dog shows that people love to talk about. So we decided to do a who is your personal best in show? Like the judges will decide who the best in show is, who's yours? So we started by sharing editor's dogs. Here's Joy Mayer's dog, whose name is this, and here's a little funny story. And then the option on the right is where, and then we created a Facebook album and invited people to send. And for like two weeks, we had people continuing to send us their dog photos. So we just add them to the Facebook album. People love that. But we started not just by saying, hey, send us pictures of your dogs, but by offering pictures of our own dogs. In terms of crowdsourcing, when we had a film, we have a documentary film festival that's here each year, and one of my favorite ways to cover it is that we send people around town, staff members, with whiteboards, and we say which movie just got out, and we ask people to write a one-word movie review. Now, if you ask people to write movie reviews for you, you won't get anything back. We've tried that, too. Hey, here's our email address. When you get home, review the movie and send. No, you're, it's way too much work, and people don't feel qualified, and they don't think they're good writers, but anyone can do this. And we've been doing it for several years now, and people say, oh, good, I'm glad you're here. I was hoping I would run into you. I've got something to say. OK, so we ask this question in the newsroom a lot. What can we accomplish together with our community that we couldn't do on our own? If we invite people to help us, if we have all these eyes and ears on the ground, what can we accomplish? So I want to tell you what that meant for us during a recent snowstorm. 
Mizzou was shut down for four days last winter. Four days, unprecedented, crazy, everyone in town is stuck at home. It was a lot of snow and we're just not, those of you up north will be laughing hysterically at us, but it was more snow than our town was equipped to handle, right? So when you think about all the ways that a newsroom responds to a community event of that magnitude, Every day for four days, there were three stories at the top of our most read list. One was kind of a live blog of like weather forecast, school closings, that kind of stuff. One was a page we did each day that said road conditions in Columbia. And what we did was embed a Google form at the bottom. What's your location? What time is it? And how are the road conditions near where you are? We invited people to look out their window and say, here's where I live. The street hasn't been plowed yet. This is useful because people are stuck at home and wondering, should I try to get to work or should I try to get to that doctor's appointment I have or not? Now, we have all kinds of disclaimers that say, we tell people not to do it when they're driving. We link to the official like Department of Transportation map. And we say, above that, we're not independently verifying all of these. But we invite people to say. So tons of traffic all day long as people try to decide, should we get out? We had our staff do it too, which kind of seeded it. But really, really popular. The other thing we did is that we used this tool called Rebel Mouse. Has anybody heard of it? Rebel Mouse. It embeds social feeds. So what you do is say, like, I could do it for myself and stick in my Twitter and my Facebook and my Instagram and my Pinterest and whatever. And, it, and rebelmouse.com slash mayorjoy would then have all of my social presence. But you can also use it as a brand to embed a Twitter list. So what I did was make a list of everybody on my staff. And anytime one of those people tweeted with the hashtag Como Snow, it showed up here. Also, any other tweets or Instagram pictures with the hashtag Como Snow, Como is Columbia, Missouri, showed up in a way that made it easy for me to add them. So the people were spending five or six minutes with this page all day long for four days. Some of those people were people who wanted to see if their picture was included, but some of the people just wanted a window into what was happening around town. How are you reflecting the conversation around town? And there are people who, if we put in a story, go search for the hashtag Como Snow on Twitter, would be totally overwhelmed and have no idea what to do. But when you aggregate it for them like this and embed it on your website. So the function is news is a conversation. And, and if you invite people to help you cover something, what does that look like? Um, another way that we invited the community to help. Last year, a local soldier died in Afghanistan. I don't know if you guys have ever have, have had that in your communities, but news does not get bigger than that. In, a town that is this size or smaller. Um, the family had been around a while, knew a lot of people. So every single piece of that was big news. When the body arrived from Dover, there were like escort, like people lined the streets with flags as they drove the casket through on the way to the funeral home. I mean, it was a heartbreaking story that really touched the whole community. So fast forward, so we covered multiple steps of this. Saturday, there was going to be a memorial service at the Big Baptist Church on Broadway. So we knew this, and we had a reporter and a photographer assigned to go, right? So part of the service, as you might imagine, is that the crazy people from Kansas who protest at funerals were coming, and they do this thing. The community responded in the way that is um, building what they call a red wall around the church. We're going to wear red t-shirts and build a wall around the church so that the family is not exposed to the people who say it was this fault of... Anyway. Um, so, turns out thousands of people were at this church hours before the service even started we were unprepared we had a reporter and photographer there but no plans to cover it as it went we were going to wait till that night and cover it right saturday morning at 10 o'clock newsroom started getting emails from people a couple people sent in photos hey i'm downtown here i'm taking some pictures do you want to publish them so luckily somebody in the newsroom responded quickly get those photos into a facebook album put some on our website along with a prominent invitation if you're there taking pictures, we'd love to see them. By the end of the day, there were more than 90 photos from readers. <laughs> Facebook Insights, the analytics within Facebook, can tell us that 40,000 people were exposed to this Facebook album because many of them had lots and lots of comments, and it's people wanting to say things like, my thoughts and prayers are with the family. Thank you so much for your service. So 40,000 people were social around a community death because they participated with this Facebook album. It was by far the most compelling way that my newsroom covered the funeral and the experience. Covered, right? Because it wasn't, like we wrote a story and we had some beautiful documentary photos from photojournalists, but this was the way that the community most responded. 
Um, I am afraid I did not include the thing that I really wanted to include. Darn it, it's not here. <coughs> Clearly, I overestimated what I was going to get in. Okay, let me tell you one other story as we talk about difficult stuff. Um, there were some shootings in town last year, a couple of young black men killed by other young black men. And as we were trying to figure out how to respond and how the community was responding, an event was planned in town. It was called Silence the Violence. And people were going to meet at the courthouse and walk, march to the alternative high school and host a day-long event, the purpose of which was to come up with solutions. So we have a reporter and photographer ready to go. We had somebody who had gone to a couple of the planning meetings for this event to try to get a sense of what it was. So we start to talk in the newsroom about how we can cover that. What is our purpose beyond documenting who's there? Is there something we can do to harness the power of the crowd and reflect the community conversation around that? What we decided to do was in the gym at the Alternative High School, there were tables set up with people like after school programs and advocacy organizations that work with youth. People there to say, here's how we can help solve the problem. My newsroom set up a table, got permission ahead of time, set up a table, hung the banner. We brought some things with us. When you talk about who do you wish, who is this content for? We had written beautiful stories about the young men who died. We write what we call life stories, featureized, reported obits on everyone in town that we can who dies. They're not just standard little obits. We realize we have a community of people here who've, who feels that they're not properly covered, who feels that they only get attention when things go wrong. Of course they're not daily tuned into our channel. They might not have even seen these. Beautiful stories, ladies and gentlemen, about the nuances of these families and what they had been through. So we printed out those life stories and took them with us. We also had done a series of reporting on what is a gang. Columbia has a really weird history with that. We have a former police chief who wanted to pretend there were no gangs and wouldn't use the word. And so we had this story. So we printed out some highlights and a timeline of Columbia's history with the concept of gangs. So we took those with us, thinking, what content do th these people need to know that we're paying attention and trying to help on this issue? And what coverage can we bring? Then here's what else we did. We brought blank 11 by 17 pieces of paper. We brought a bucket of markers. And we printed on the pieces of paper two questions. Here's what I think contributes to youth and gang violence in Columbia. And here's what I'm going to do to silence the violence. And we invited people to take a marker and write their answer to, those two, to one of those two questions. As they did, we did two things. We taped it up on the wall behind us. So there's a distribution channel involved in just walk by and see what other people have said. We also invited them to hold it up, and we took their picture. We got the sister of one of the victims saying, here's what I think contributes to youth and gang violence in Columbia, looking straight into the camera. That is a totally different kind of reflecting community conversation than what you get as a reporter when you talk to as many people as you can, you pick the, you pick the five best people to include. It's through the filter of journalism, right? Totally different reaction when people are looking in the camera and sharing their personal story. So we put those in a Facebook album. Again, people tag themselves and have a conversation around it there. We also put them on our website and put some of them in print. So what question is it you wish people would answer? And how have you invited them to answer it? How have you taken what you're doing to them instead of expecting them to come to you? I suspect there are times where you guys feel like, I know people are talking about this stuff, but they're certainly not talking to the student paper about it, or they're talking about it somewhere else. So can you invite them to text in their responses and, and publish those? How are you making it easy for people to communicate? And sometimes that means taking something to them physically. So we got a really wonderful response to that. Also raised some eyebrows about the general notion of advocacy. Are we there to help solve the problem? Is that the purpose of the newspaper? Um, we didn't say, we're going to make these things happen. We're not advocating for a specific solution, but we were there as a facilitator to say, what do you wish would happen? What, what should we be paying attention to here? What are the questions? So that, in my mind, is social journalism around difficult and around Mizzou football and around teenage gang shootings. So um, I'm going to stop there. And thank you so much. I'll be here for another couple of hours, another hour and a half. So if you guys want to keep talking about it, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.